Welcome to Food Professor Podcast, presented by Cattle, Season 5, Episode 10. I'm Michael LeBlanc. And I'm the Food Professor, Sylvain Charlebois. Our special guest this week is a grocery executive that needs some, but not much of an introduction. Pear Bank, President and CEO of Loblaw Companies Limited, founded in 1919, now with over 2,400 locations, a couple hundred thousand employees. Pear came to Canada from Europe after an interesting and diverse business background to lead Loblaw late 2023. It's a great conversation, and he answers our question, what do you think of us now? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Really enjoyed our discussion with uh, Pierre, to be honest, uh, he, he's got a personality. He's, he, you can feel that he wants to bring the company in a different direction. He talks about it. He was very honest about it. So, uh, yeah, great conversation. I really enjoyed it. I like the way this is trending for podcasting. Trump, Kamala Harris, Trudeau, Pear Bank, all realizing the powerful communication vehicle that popular podcasts like ours is and the role we play in modern media. So I'm liking yeah. what's going on now so speaking of podcasting you and i will be together not next week the week after once again at uh the coffee association of canada's great event on the 14th that's right uh almost sold out uh, we just got uh, we got the agenda it's action packed we've got a bunch of interviews we're going to be doing there uh so uh, if you're in the gta and interested in anything that's happening in coffee get to that conference and come say hi to us because we'll be there so yeah, absolutely it's always a great show of course hosted by our good friend tony chapman and uh yeah he always does a good job energizing the entire place uh and i don't think he needs coffee either like he just <laughs> does it <laughs> he's self-caffeinated that boy That's he is right caffeinated all right well let's get in the news and let's let's start actually with uh with pear bank because he published an op-ed in the globe and yeah. mail uh, he talks about the nature and state of competition, some of which he talks about on the uh, interview. Uh, the interview is done a couple of weeks ago. He addresses what he calls false narratives and, interestingly, directly addresses the Competition Act draft guidelines, talking about property controls. Uh, and he says, puts his hand up, we, being law of laws, are ready to remove these property controls if others do so. So what do you make of this, throwing down the gauntlet to the big four? Well, I mean, for, for once, the, the Globe and Mail it publishes a, a, an op-ed that actually makes sense <laughs> in the food <laughs> area. I mean, their track record the last couple of years hasn't been great, but this one was uh, is certainly worth the read. It's funny, when I, when I read his, uh, his piece, uh, Pear's piece, I, I felt, wow, this is, this is really a powerful piece. I, I honestly think he was just sending out a message to the entire industry saying, listen, we can do better. We need to do better. And uh, it just it just feels like Loblaw and Pear uh, are trying to improve the sector's faith, uh, essentially. And so it goes beyond it goes beyond his main as CEO's Loblaw. That's that's not how I felt when I read his piece today. Uh, and I'll ask you this question directly: Are you paid by Loblaws in any way, shape, or form? <laughs> No, no, actually, I almost, I almost asked Pear, uh, no, could yeah, you just maybe, do I guess me a we favor? should ask him, eh? yeah, I mean, we could ask him. Just that, do me right? a favor, because, you know, he know, he knows I've been attacked, and every day someone actually mentions that I'm a Loblaw chill, and, and the people at Loblaw very well know, I mean, I, I will criticize Loblaw as much as I would, uh, I would uh, yeah. give them some credit on different things, and yeah, no, I, do, I am not paid by Loblaw, I did get I actually received a generous grant back in 2017 to support a postdoc. That grant actually went to Dow, not to me, to Dow, and it was $60,000, and I was able to pay a uh, financially strained postdoc, and uh, we did some good work on food fraud, uh, and we did publish a couple of papers. So I'm grateful for, uh, for, for getting this from the Weston Foundation, not Loblaw, the Weston Foundation, and, uh, but we did go work with it. And that, to be clear, just in case anybody knows, know the vernacular of universities, a postdoc is a person. So that money went from <laughs> Dalhousie to an individual uh, aspiring student, right? Yeah, I should clarify that. Yeah, that's a good thing that you mentioned that. Yeah. All right. It's, 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 it's started, it started to die down a little bit, but every now once in a while it comes back up. Let's take and the opportunity uh, when we can, right? Let's take yeah, exactly. Uh, let's uh, let's get back to uh, circle back on something from last week. McDonald's. So they did identify. Remember at the end, at the last 
the last bit of news before we recorded our pod was that they somebody mentioned onions and indeed it did uh, identify mcdonald's did identify it was the onions not the beef as the source of the outbreak uh, they pulled their quarter pounder traffic dropped off a cliff i have a very good friend at placer.ai which tracks uh, traffic ethan chernowski if you're listening shout out to the work you do customer visits to mcdonald's dropped 6.4 percent this is placer data across america 24 percent in colorado where the outbreak was happening and then by thursday it continued to drop nine percent nationwide 31 percent colorado so they got some work ahead of them to build oh, back yeah. as we said last month a very professional organization they've identified the problem here's my question to you i found it interesting that more and more that it's not the beef the cattle the proteins it's the vegetables that are getting us in trouble is is that is that your perception as well well, there are recalls. Uh, they continue. We continue to see recalls for a variety of different products. But uh, I mean, I think the common denominator is California. <laughs> I mean, California growing uh, vegetables there is is incredibly complicated, especially in light of the fact that they they were running out of water for a while. It's not Arizona too, now. right? Arizona is yeah, a problem too, right? But California, what they what they've done is that they go and get water far farther and uh, often that water is close to where uh beef cattle uh would 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 graze and uh, and so the water would be contaminated which is really a problem we've so the uh salinas uh region which is uh, the one region where the farm was for onions for mcdonald's is the same region uh, that was responsible for that great uh, Roman lettuce recall we mm, had four mm. years ago. Do you remember that? Yeah, the end of the Roman Empire, I called it. Yeah, yeah, the Roman Empire. It was during Christmas. I remember I actually you went into a grocery store and nobody was touching Romaine lettuce. It didn't matter where it, fr- it was from. Every, every and, bit of Romaine lettuce come, came off the shelves or nobody was buying it. It, nobody was buying, and so that's really uh, that was. So the, the Salinas region has been uh, involved with with many many of the recalls. I, I actually thought that McDonald's responded very well, and mm-hmm. and I was asked, well, th- does McDonald's have a food safety problem? No, it has a PR problem. I mean, really, because eh? it did respond well, unlike another company we know, Chipotle. Well, I, Do you remember? I, I, well, I was just going to say, you know, it's interesting because we also saw in the news uh, that the uh, CFIA said that the plant making, the plant based milk facility that was making uh, those products Silk. that got that got into trouble, um, they were offside. And I got the feeling in the article, or maybe it was a quote, we inspected it, but we put less emphasis on inspecting plant based because we thought them these alternatives would be generally safe. And and you know low risk of listeria. Maybe that's not the case. No, that's right. And uh, well, I mean, I, I, we we did some work with the CFI for many years uh, uh, on 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 this risk based approach. Mm-hmm. Uh, the more risks uh, are more involved in in doing whatever you're doing as a food company, uh, the more inspection you will get, essentially. And uh, but with plant based, I, I do think that uh, there is some unknowns there for sure, and uh, and the silk recall is definitely uh, a, mm. a good example of that. Uh, great value was so so impacted by the Great Value brand by Walmart, and so uh, so okay. yeah, it was that was an, that well we did we we have spoken about this recall in the past, but there's uh, there's some question marks really for sure about, about that recall. But overall, I think we're going to see more regulators uh, inspecting based on risks, based on, uh, you know, sectors that could represent uh, mm. more problems. Yeah. Uh, sticking with uh, plant-based alternative beverages, I don't know if you saw the news out from Starbucks today that they are no longer going to upcharge for plant-based products going into their coffee. Yeah, Interesting. that's right. So that's, you know, they, Starbucks has got a long way to come back, and uh, so already there. And they also did. I don't know if you saw they they had launched a uh, coffee with olive oil in olive it. Olive oil, yeah. Canceled that. So, yeah. uh, you know, you could really that was I think a passion project from the last CEO. So I think the new guys coming in and just saying, you know, we got to. Well, know, the we, olive oil decision was a no-brainer. I mean, olive oil is just so expensive now. You're going to save well, a lot of money. Well, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it, this guy's not waiting 90 days to assess. They're, they're digging in, and, and so there'll be a very interesting story to watch in the next, uh, in the next 
number of months. Now, you sound a little bit different. Uh, you're on your headset. Uh, where are you and what are you doing? Oh, I'm in Ottawa, actually, and uh, I was uh, testifying, actually, today at Senate uh, against Bill C-282, mm, mm. and I was greeted with some really nice farmers. They drove hours of hours to say hello. <laughs> they, bring, they bring you some milk, maybe. How sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Not sour milk, just uh, milk. Yeah, yeah. Actually, you know what? I, I, I was, as I was going through security, I was grateful that you know, when you walked in the room, everyone had to go through security. <laughs> oh, gee. No pitchforks allowed. No cattle prods. <laughs> I gee. know. But, yeah. uh, no, I think the same. I mean, I was actually with the um, – I was testifying with the former ambassador to uh, Japan mm -hmm. uh, and a, uh, a professor, uh, Roger Paris, uh, from uh, the University of Ottawa. And uh, it was a great session, to be honest. I, I said it is always nice because uh, uh, people are a little bit more laid back. Uh, they're just, but this one in particular was very political. Uh, 282 is incredibly political. For people who may not know, it's basically 282 is about safeguarding supply management, supply managed sectors, so feathers, poultry. Eggs and dairy uh, from uh, during during any new future trade talks, including of course with with Americans. Uh, doesn't matter who actually wins the presidency, uh, Harris or Trump, we're likely going to be renegotiating uh, the uh, U.S. Mexico Canada deal. So Cosma. a lot of, a lot of emotions in the rooms for sure. And and what is the next steps with this bill? So you come down, you testify, uh, a bunch of people with pitchforks and torches surround you and uh, have their opinion. But what are the next steps now from this for this bill? Well, I mean, that, that's a discussion already in the we Senate. had. Uh, it's already so in I the did, Senate. yeah, I did have that discussion with senators and a couple of. I mean, some MPs are in the room, and it's very. I, listen, to be honest, Michael, I've never seen MPs. I've never seen a full room, like a full room of people at Senate. Typically, Senate is just, you know, studying stuff, inviting people. Uh, now, tonight, they were like, there was no, there was no empty seats and MPs were there to, you know, see what, what how things were uh, going to go. And of course, they wanted to know what I was, what, what I was going to say. But uh, I think between you and I, I think Senate or that committee, which is about public affairs or foreign affairs, trades, I think the committee will actually recommend the Senate to vote against it, but I'm not sure Senate will go to will vote against it. I actually think that it will go ahead unless, unless, of course, we have an election. Yeah. An election would kill the bill. Election would kill the bill. Um, interesting, interesting. So that's kind of what, what we're going right now. So if, let's say hypothetically, we don't have an election until the budget in the spring, chances are we will see this bill uh, come into law. Well, speaking of election, I guess we get to talk about this next week. A uh, big election happening, of course, in the United what States. Election? What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, listen, I think whether it's Harris or whether it's Trump, uh, Trump being more on the extreme side of, uh, of tariffs, a lot of talk about tariffs. I was reading this great uh, article interview with uh, Lifeheiser, the the chief uh, negotiator, and he's yeah. the, he's a big tariff guy, uh, and he's uh, he's in the Trump camp. So uh, anyway, no point in us commenting right now. But let's uh, we'll have some interesting things to talk about. Uh, I, I think next the next week. regime doesn't matter who wins, but the next uh, American regime will be very uh, protectionist. We are likely to see more tariffs, and that's never good news for anyone. Like anyone. Yeah. So that's the problem that we have, and and frankly, is there a difference between Harris and uh, and and Trump? I, on, this, honestly, on this file, it's an order of magnitude. I think, like, it's a definite order of magnitude. I think that's that's, that's right? what it is, and it's about. I think it's more about style. It's really about style. Well, let's uh, let's uh, put that aside until next week and the weeks to follow, because we'll have a better. We'll know something. I don't know what we'll know next week, but we'll we'll all know something more than we do today. So. Uh, yeah, there we go. All well, right, they well, often say they often say that voting day is not results day in America. <laughs> not this time, that's for sure. All right, let's get to our fantastic interview uh, with Pear from 
Loblaws. But first, let's hear from our great friends at Cattle. Ever feel like the world of ratings and reviews needed a superhero? Well, enter Cattle, the caped crusader with Canada's largest, most diverse, and daily active consumer panels. That's right, Cattle is not your average podcast sponsor. So why choose Cattle? Because Cattle excels in consumer insights from your consumer, while also blazing trails in the realm of ratings and reviews, pioneering the future landscape of user-generated content. Beyond the valuable syndicated receipt data, they stand as unparalleled collector of reviews at scale, irrespective of category or price point. A testament to their impact, partnerships with giants like Walmart, Canadian Tire, and more. Visit AskCattle.com now for an exclusive The Food Professor podcast listener discount on your first review or research campaign today. That's AskCattle.com. Well, we are thrilled today to have as a special guest uh, the CEO of Loblaws, Pierre Bank. Pierre, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Really pleased to be here. So you bring a unique perspective to, to Canada, leading one of the largest and most influential companies uh, in our country. C- could you share more about your journey to this role and what it entails? Yeah. Um, first of all, a bit of my my background. So uh, I'm Danish, uh, had a few years in the army. I was a lieutenant, started engineering, worked uh, in, in, in the industry first, hydraulic industry. I worked in the U.S. for one and a half years came back to Denmark, and then I, uh, after, after a short stay at, uh, at Mars, I, uh, I came into retail when I was 31. Hmm. At the age of uh, about 35, I became the CEO of, uh, of the, at that time, the largest Danish, uh, Danish retailer. Uh, a few, few years later, I was the CEO of the Scandinavian, uh, the Scandinavian co-ops that was in, uh, in Norway and, and Denmark and, and Sweden. And then after having uh, been in that company for eight years, I, uh, I took on a new challenge because I thought that I wanted to learn more, learn more in retail. And that's why I, I joined Tesco's because at that time, Tesco's was uh, still good. But at that time, they're one of the leading retailers in the world, both with their club card program, their operating model. So I uh, oh, yeah. started off as a CEO of, uh, of Tesco in uh, in Hungary. With, the, with, and, with Tesco, was it your first exposure to food retail? No, 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 because no. Uh, when I uh, when I, jo- I was in co-op, uh, the Danish co-op, who at that time was right. the largest retailer in Denmark, and that was uh, that was primarily uh, food retailing. So, okay. uh, so yeah. No, and then, and then Tesco for, for a few years in Hungary, and then uh, I was promoted to be a part of the executive committee in, in, in Tesco. Uh, and then uh, I moved with my family to, uh, to London, uh, we have two uh, two boys uh, now, 22, 25. At that time, much much younger, and they went to the American school. So, so that was a really really good journey, and I definitely learned a lot at Tesco's. But after that, I joined uh, the company uh, Selling Group, um, which I took from twenty nine percent market share to thirty seven percent market share over over the past eleven years, and that was the company I joined from uh, just over over a year ago. And there's so many similarities from uh, from Selling Group to, uh, to Loblaws. Of course, Loblaws is uh, a much larger company, but Selling Group was also a part of a like, family-founded company. And the funny part with that was that when I came in 2012, in 106 years, because it was founded in 1906, there have only been three CEOs before me. So the founder for 47 wow. years, the mm-hmm. founder's son for another 47 years, and then the guy before me, been the CEO for, for 12 years, but in the company for 30. So when I resigned and talked to the founder's son's widows, you know, she was absolutely not happy with me resigning after only being in the company for 11 years. Because <laughs> she imagine. definitely thought that I would take another 10 years, which, you mm-hmm. know, was my plan until... Uh, until Galen called. Wow. So, I mean, you come from Europe. You've been in Canada for a while. Um, were you surprised uh, at the attention and passion that Loblaws generates here in, in our country? I, of course, had expected a lot of, uh, a lot of attention as, uh, <laughs> as being head of the biggest uh, Private employer in uh, in the country, but but still, yes, there was a, a few things that uh, that did surprise me, because remember, I was the CEO of Tesco in Hungary, and and, and at that time in Hungary, we uh, faced a lot of scrutiny from uh, a lot of politicians from from the environment there, because at that time I was 
CEO of a foreign retailer in Hungary as the biggest private employer. And at that time, they really, really tried to give us a hard time. They even imposed a 2% retail tax on sales. And that only applied what? somehow wow. to the uh, they only applied to the foreign retailers, the local retailers what? in Hungary. You know, they somehow they managed to exempt that. So, so I thought coming to Canada, finally, you know, I will uh, be loved by the politicians. You know, we are <laughs> Canadian owned. We are oh, investing two billion into the country every yeah. year. So I thought, you know, that's going to be easy. It yeah. didn't turn out exactly like that, as you know. <laughs> no, absolutely. Well, it, it's it's one of the things that I was thinking about as we, uh, Sylvana and I talked about having this discussion with you, is that you're not unused to operating in the European theater and the European area, which has lots of different countries and cultures and politicians and sustainability issues. So it, it equally complex. I wanted to know if there's anything when you came here, you seem, I see your posts on LinkedIn. You lo- you seem to love being in the stores, like a like an operator. You love being with the people. Is there anything about the, the country and operating here that surprised you. Often when I talk to foreign executives who come to Canada, they can read a map, they can see a globe, but they're still surprised by the the scale of the country. Any Anything like that that, that surprised you from an operating perspective? First of all, I, I must admit that there are many, many more similarities than differences between European retail and Canadian retail. Mm. So, you know, it's only a few, a few differences. But I... Of course, you know, Canada is a huge country. It's a great country. And, you know, from east to west. But it's almost like if you compare stores from in Halifax to Calgary, I think they're more similar than stores within Toronto. Because mm. the ethnicity in Toronto, the differences from uh, from south to east to north to uh, to west in, in Toronto, it's, it's just so, so different. Mm. And the way that we tailor for... Uh, for the different population in uh, in Toronto and and in Canada in in a whole, I think that's something that I have not seen before. Because mm-hmm. how mm-hmm. we can flex the assortment is uh, yeah is really really uh, good, and that's also uh, one of the reasons why we are we are so successful. And it, you know, it it kind of reminds us of that saying about you know trying to change the the tires on an aircraft from a flight to Toronto to Vancouver. It's not like the the demographics are staying still, right? We've got millions, literally millions of new Canadians that are changing the, 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 the look and the landscape, even as you operate in taking in that. In yeah, that's true. That's true. And that's, you know, right? as, uh, except for the, for the, for the traffic, that's very different from, from where I, uh, where, where I come from. <laughs> then of course the, uh, the population and, uh, and the way that the diversity we have here in Canada, I really, really yeah, love yeah. the diversity we have, but mm-hmm. it's so different from, um, from, from what I'm used to where, you know, most yeah. people, they, uh, they look like me. That's not the case in Canada. And I, yeah, yeah. I really, really love that. It also gives us as a business, a lot of growth opportunities to, mm. uh, to be able to, uh, to cater for them and, and having a population growth is of course good for, good for retail sure. in, in sure. Canada in general. Else, I think, you know, what surprises me, I think, a lot of uh, stakeholders talk about there's no uh, competition here in Canada, and that's really, really a big surprise to me because yeah. we are, you know, big five, I think, rather big retailers, and then we have a lot of small retailers. And among mm. the five biggest, we have the two largest brick and mortar retailers in the world, with Walmart and Costco's. And yeah. if I compare the G7, you know, to my to my knowledge. Uh, we're the only we're the only country in G7 who have like a participation of 33 percent or about, about a third of uh, of foreign uh, foreign mm-hmm. retailers in in the country. So all this discussion about no competition, I think that's that's unheard of. And mm-hmm. you know, also talking about discount, we also have a, a 16 percent discount uh, pen in uh, in Canada, and that's not even talking about Walmart and talking about our, our own uh, real Canadian superstores. Sure, sure, sure. Mm-hmm. Let's let's um. Let's broaden the lens a little bit. Let's talk about innovation and leadership. What, is, what does that look like at, at Loblaw? And what's your experience so far? And, and you've had experience of this before. You're running a very large organization, which by necessity has some bureaucracy and process and controls, but you still need to be able to innovate and move at the pace of, of disruption. How do you how do you square that circle? What's your approach to thinking about that? No, no, that? That, absolutely. And that's, uh, that's a very, very important point. We need to continue to innovate to uh, to do good for, for our customers. And I think I have to give credit to Loblaws because in the past, Loblaw have been very, very innovative. 
both with regard to developing some world-leading retail banners and, you know, when we required Shopper Throckmart more than, more than 10 years ago and how Galen, the management team, Jeff, have been able to develop a Shopper Throckmart over the last 10 years. I think that's really, really good. Not to talk about our leading control brands and our very, very strong optimum program. So I think being innovative has been a part of uh, of Lob Laws for for many many years, and it's it's my job together with the, together with the teams to continue to develop the, the the company, continue to basically challenge status quo, which I think we are doing right now. And I think one of the things that I bring is that I move with pace. I might be a little bit impatient. I'm not afraid of uh, <laughs> of uh, of losing. So that's, uh, you know, I think, you know, if you're afraid of losing, you'll never win. So that's kind of of my philosophy. I want to test a lot of things. I want to fail fast and then move on. So I think that's, you know, some of the things that that you are seeing, uh, if you're looking at my LinkedIn post, so whether it's the the no-name store or whether it's uh, what we're doing on on the right-hand side, whether it's some of our, our tactical trading programs, I think innovation is key. And that's for sure something that I'll continue to, uh, to work on. Mm. You, you've been in Canada for, for a short time, but a lot of that has happened at the company since you've been, since you've become CEO of, of the company. Uh, one of the things that uh, you've launched is, is the no name store model. Um, tell us more about, about the model. I believe you have three stores now open, uh, so I think the first, those stores opened in early September. So we're many weeks in now. Uh, what what are you seeing right now so far coming come out of these stores, and uh, what are your plans moving forward? Before I uh, answer that question, I'd just like to get back to uh, you know that we have done a lot of uh, a lot of new initiatives over over the past uh, the past year, mm-hmm. and. I I promise the teams that I will uh, not do as many new initiatives the next year because we also need to land <laughs> we need to land the initiative that we, have, uh, that we have started. So it's not that I'm firing another ten yeah. new things over the next year. We we need to really integrate and uh, yeah implement the stuff that we. Uh, that just, we when I go on LinkedIn, when I go on LinkedIn and I see your videos, there's a, there was something new every week. It seems. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, so no, I I, I won't expect that. Then I think. Uh, <laughs> We get too busy, you know. We also we also need to uh, make sure that things they work. No, back to uh, back to the uh, the no name store. No so name, it, yeah. it is a, a three store uh, store pilot. We have opened two stores so far, and uh, and the next store uh, I believe is opening the the thirty first of uh, of October. So the idea with the no name store is that we wanted to test how low we could uh, we could sell groceries and still maintain an okay business case because it's always easy. Just to lower prices, and then you know, as a big company as ours, and then uh, then give a give away product and sell them at half price. But our model here is to the idea is to take out all unnecessary costs. So it's like cheap rent, not having prime locations, having small stores. It's a minimum spend of capital. It's halving our IT cost. It's only one thousand three hundred products, mainly groceries. Few weekly deliveries from logistics. It's low shrink. It's low waste. Limited opening hours. Hardly any marketing, no flyers, and then we have an EDLP strategy. And by doing all this, our idea is to give back everything we save to our customers in low prices. And that's why that we, I think we said that we are on average up to 20% cheaper than the cheapest of, uh, of, our, of our competitors and our own uh, NOFA. And we are, actually, we have 300 products that are more than 20%, uh, 20% cheaper. Mm. Our learning so far, I think, the team, when I, when I spoke to Melanie Singh, who is heading up our, our hard discount division, she said that over about six to seven weeks over the summer, she stood up a new banner. And the amount of questions that she has received <laughs> from her colleagues after yeah. summer, they couldn't believe that they haven't heard anything about this. So yeah. I think, you know, if nothing else, it learned us how to, uh, how to move with a lot of pace. Yeah. The early results from customers, the customers, they really like what they are, what they are seeing. They are, they are positive about the prices. They even, you know, positive about the selection, that 1,300 product, that, that mm. is a lot. But mm-hmm. where, of course, it's not, it's not as, uh, as promising. That's uh, because customers, they need to shop elsewhere. So it is a compromise shopping trip because you cannot buy, uh, 
buy your meat. You cannot buy your, your dairy. So that's that's one of the compromise. So mm-hmm. right. let's see going forward with customers, they're willing to uh, to do that that compromise. You, and that's, the that's a bet method. you're making, right? Right, Pear? That's a bet that you're making is that consumers will and can will continue to do yeah, multiple, yeah, it's a bet, multiple but, shops a week, yeah. right? That's that's mm-hmm. a, at the fundamental element yeah. of it, right? And, and the other bit, I think uh, you also pointed it out in, in some of your comments, that's it's EDLP, so it's everyday low price. There's no high low, there's mm-hmm. no promotions. So that's so so different from uh, from Canada. And, and and one of the surprises now coming back to it that you know the promo penetration in Canada is higher than everywhere else. I thought that you know Poland and Denmark and Sweden had a, had a high promo pen but Canada is higher than everything else I've seen so so just that the customer they there's no call to action because prices are so cheap but unfortunately customers they don't know what they don't know so they don't know you know 1300 product they might know that that a pound of banana is 59 uh, 59 cent but they don't know what flour or sugar would, uh-huh. uh, would 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 cost so i think that's that's kind of the the challenge with the with that format but let's see Open the third floor, the thirty, the thirty-first, and then uh, we'll take the learnings. And if it works, it's great. And uh, if not, then we will pivot and take the learnings and, and apply elsewhere. That's great. One one thing that uh, that Michael and I we've we've discussed uh, over the years uh, on this show is is Loblaw's approach to private labeling. I mean, it, it is it's been the benchmark in our country for quite a long time now, for decades. Um, how do you see the future of private labeling in Canada? I mean, you are the benchmark, and it seems as though other players in the market are trying to catch up to to, to Loblaws. But how do you see the future of private labeling in general in Canada? I think it's going to stay. I think it's uh, it's going to grow. I probably think it's going to grow at the same pace as uh, as some of the, the private brands. And my belief is that you know there's room for both room for both our control brands and uh, and the brands that customers they uh, they love as well so i think we can work side by side and that's also uh, some of the uh, the signal that i've sent to uh, to our our vendors at our, our vendor summit that we had uh, half half a year ago when this is said i think for us it's about continue to be innovative it's continue to excel it's continue to do even better at our our pc and our our no name brands because our pc is the number one brand in canada and again huge credit to the teams before me because again looking across the globe i i think that pc is one of the best control brands that i have ever seen and even you know when i when i started last year i spent a lot of time talking to customers you know talking to them in the parking lots you know hey i'm new to canada could you please advise me where to do my grocery shopping <laughs> and a lot of, a lot of you know, but a lot of those customers they uh, they actually said yeah remember to buy pc and that's a good reason to go to to law law so i think all that discussion with customers went really really well and they had no clue who i, who I was except the second customer I interviewed they said, "Hey, aren't you the new guy from Roblox?" And yeah, okay. <laughs> but, uh, but all the rest, no, they didn't. Funny. They didn't recognize me. The gig was up then. The, yeah, gig, yeah, the exactly. gig was up then. Wait a minute, I'm talking to somebody here. Um, uh, no, I, we, so, so I think we need to continue to innovate. I think it has yeah. it has room, and it's uh, it's something that all great retailers have. But again, mm-hmm. I think we need to aim for not only growing our control brands, but also growing the uh, the brands as well, because. We had lots of small, innovative suppliers around Canada who's really helping, uh, giving something new to our customers. Let's let's uh, let's talk about that. Let's unpack that a little bit, just in the context. And we've touched on it already that there's, you know, the Canada is a changing landscape every day. Like many Western countries, where populations getting older, we've got lots of new Canadians coming in to bring different perspectives. Now, just to tap into the planning, how you, you know, put together with the team a planning cycle to say we've got 50 moving parts all at the same time. How do you, how do you sit down with the team and coalesce that into a strategy that you can say, well, we need to go acquire or make it easier to have new and innovative brands. It's always difficult for innovative brands. I think no, it, it, it is difficult. Yeah. And, uh, I don't think we're bureaucratic, but I'm sure that some of the suppliers would say we are because we cannot list new products right. every other week. We need yeah. to, you know, we have some windows where, where, where that can happen. Mm. But when, when this is set, so we uh, we established our our small supplier uh, program, I think, already in mm. in January this year. And that's really to help small suppliers have an easier access to us. Yeah. So we have a special assistant for small suppliers 
we are providing a, a six month shelf life commitment uh, and faster payments because a lot of the small suppliers oh, yeah. they they cannot cope with the cash. So we said we will we will pay you as fast as we possibly can, and that that's about seven days. And that is important for, for seven me, days. Me, you will, you'll pay in seven days. That's yeah, yeah. We pro- all wow. all these small the thousand small suppliers we pay them within seven days. Wow. We would like to pay them immediately, but that's kind of how our system can sure, uh, sure. can cope huh. with. So mm-hmm. that dedicated support system that we have for small suppliers, I think that's good. That's something that's something that I did in the past, and something that's uh, really really helpful. So that's like the really small suppliers, but it's also about yeah. yeah. Again, you uh, alluded to how do we cater for uh, for the new uh, the new Canadians, and we have a big focus here. And, and, and Frank Gambioli, who is running our supermarket division, he has uh, actually introduced 650 new items year to date in our mm. supermarket division. Mm. 250 in fresh and 400 in, in the center of the store, and that's working really, really well. And that's also mm. one of the growth area that we have in, in the supermarket division. So, in addition to that, we're also taking some TNT products in. So you'll yeah. see a lot of end caps mm. in our in our in our uh, superstores with TNT products. So we utilize the skill and scale of the group and, mm. and utilize what uh, what Tina and, and her team are so good at at TNT. Yeah, but it's a it's a fantastic uh, that's a fantastic business. Tina and her, and her family have done such Ooh, an amazing absolutely. job. Absolutely. Let me just do a quick follow up on on the other element of uh, changing, and that is people. So you you have a lot of people that work for you under your duty of care, and and that's changing too. It, it, any any thoughts on how you uh, you know on the one hand you bring in new products for new consumers, but on the other hand. I'm sure you're out there looking for new, talented people in different ways. You know, yeah. I, th- I think actually I'm really pleased with uh, with the team I have. I uh, I only uh, I only made made one change in mm. uh, you know one significant change since, since I came, and that mm. was just because I wanted to have uh, to carve out the hard discount and have that as a, as a separate division. Except Structur- for that, structurally, right? Structurally. Yeah, structurally. Yeah. I say, yeah, except yeah. for that, I. Uh, I, I I have a great team that uh, that I inherited. Mm. I'm really really pleased uh, pleased with. Uh, with that team, so so that's actually some some of the things that I'm proud of. That I, mm. I I have the team, I'm working with the team, and I didn't bring in a, you know an army of consultants to shape up yeah. our strategy. We have done yeah. that with mm-hmm. our existing team, and I think that's uh, that's good. At least and, uh, and, I, and yeah, interesting. I hear interesting work going on with the team members in the store. Right, like you've got how many employees? Hundreds, thousands of employees, yeah, and so two, you've got to be innovative to twenty. Oh, yeah, right. You got to be innovative to to make sure they understand that you know that's that you're going to be a great place and that they have a choice and this is a great choice. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're right, you're right. And I think you know in retailers across the across the world, it is it is a challenge with uh, with keeping uh, keeping people in stores. Yeah. I think we are yeah. much much better now than oh I know we are much much better now than than we were three years ago. It's easier to keep to keep our our college mm-hmm. in stores now than uh, than it used to be. It's still tough, though. We still have, have a yep. lot of rotation. Yeah. Although that, you know, when I visit my, our management teams around around the country, it's uh, it's very often that I meet people who have been there for 20, 30, 40, even, even sure. 50 years. Sure. It's, like, it's like families if you go to St. John or if you go to Calgary, if you go to Edmonton. Yeah. It's, it, it's their life. They really thrive working in, uh, working in stores. That's a big part of, uh, of the local community where we play an important role. Fantastic. Now, my last question for me, and then I'll pass the mic back to Sylvain to bring us uh, to bring us home. I just wanted to touch on, on a very different note, this whole idea of the retail media networks, right? The grocers around certainly North America and, and I, I suspect in Canada are very intrigued by this opportunity. It's super, you know, it's high margin, but you got to do a lot of work to get there. And it's net new incremental. Are you positive about this whole retail media opportunity for, for Loblaw and for the industry? You, you're absolutely right. So uh, no matter who you speak to around the world, within retail, whether it's other retailers, other colleagues, it's consultants, everyone they're talking about retail media. And and I agree, it is uh, it is important. It's important for us. It's still small. Will it grow bigger? Yes, it will. Mm-hmm. And actually, it, it will give something for uh, for our customers as well, because if we can showcase some of the new innovative products from our suppliers in stores, some of our promotions, that would do something both for our customers and uh, and for uh, and for the business. So so I think that's uh, that's something you will uh, you will see more of going forward. 
I, I want to close with, uh, with a question uh, in relation to prospective vendors out there uh, wanting to do business with, uh, with, with Loblaw. So I guess what's, what's the best way to work with you uh, and, and your team to get their, their products on your shelves and win uh, with, with Loblaw? I think probably it's not one only, what only best way. I think uh, being innovative, giving us mm-hmm. uh, the possibility to look at innovation, you know, maybe take advice from uh, from our, our great uh, great buyers. I think that will be uh, that will be a good start for the very very small suppliers. We have our small supplier program, but I think continue to uh, to approach the teams that uh, they know already. We are really, really open to uh, to suppliers being more innovative and coming coming with uh, with new products because we have a huge range of products and our customer they would like to see new products uh, all the time. Mm. Well, uh, again, thank you so much for taking some time. I know you're a busy person. <laughs> you're, you're no, no, it's pleased. No, no, I'm pleased really to be lucky. here. You know, great, yeah, no, great discussion. Great. We really appreciate it, uh, Pierre. Thank you so much for joining us on the Food Professor Podcast today. Thank you. My pleasure. All right. Like I said, uh, great interview, and uh, we really appreciate the help from uh, Catherine at uh, Loblaw and, and Pear for making the time to talk with us. Uh, so uh, thanks again for uh, spending some time with uh, the Food Professor podcast. Let's uh, talk about a few more things before we go. Uh, the Hunger Count 2024 report is out, yep. and uh, some pretty shocking... Did you uh, see how many, how many people go to food banks every month? What? So... I mean, it's, where do I start with this? I mean, is this simply the fact that food is so expensive that more people are going? We have more no. Canadians. Like, what's going on here that, with these big numbers? Now, I, you know, you're a good researcher. I know a little bit about research. I don't want to put two data points together to come up with just because the two things happen at the same time. Much larger population. A lot more people going to food banks. Food is higher. What's driving these big increases? Uh, it's, well, it's an affordability crisis, which means that people aren't earning enough or they don't necessarily have the financial support to actually survive. And, uh, I, I don't believe it's really about food prices alone. It may be one factor, but I, I relatively, I do believe that food inflation is not a huge factor compared to housing, for example, Mm -hmm. or other things in our lives. I mean, a lot of things have actually gone up in price. Uh, starting with housing and, and everything else. Rent, yeah. Of course. I mean, to, to put things into perspective, if you're a family of four, you're spending an extra thousand dollars this year to feed that same family. But if you actually carry a mortgage of say $300,000, uh, with a variable rate over 25 years, you're looking at an extra bill of six, seven, eight thousand dollars $8,000. So that, that is going to hurt. And so that's why I think Generally speaking, if there is uh, some issues related to wealth creation in, in, in a country, you're going to see more people go to food banks. Now, what, what's being argued out there, which bothers me a little bit, to be honest, is that a lot of people are, are basically suggesting that more people are just you know, riding the wave. They're just uh, abusing the system and they're going to food banks, but they don't really necessarily qualify. You know, there is some social media posts of people filming themselves teaching each other how to do that. So there's not, you know, maybe there's just one or two, but I have seen these posts of individuals saying, hey, it's free food in Canada. Yeah. Here's how to get it. So it's not zero. It could be close to zero. Yeah, I, I must say I, I, I really am having some difficulties accepting that. Like I, we're talking about food and, and human beings. I mean, if you're going to a food bank, you don't really need it. Like, who are you? I mean, you're stealing basically food from someone else who actually needs it. Uh, and so I, I'm, I'm a bit concerned by this, to be honest, Michael. And, and, and so I've actually been in discussion with Food Bank Scanner over the last couple of days uh, to, to get some, uh, some more information about h- how they're filtering people, how they're qualifying people. And, and it's not an easy ask. I mean, it's at the end of the day, the decision to go to a food bank is a really darn difficult one, no matter who you are. I mean, it's tough. Let's talk also about the other side of this 
issue with the uh, cri- the waste crisis report from Second Harvest, and we've touched on this for the entire, I think, the entire duration of the podcast in the context of best before dates. But I think you published a stat that was even shocking to me, even as much as we talked that you know half the food in this country gets wasted one way, shape, or another. Have I got that right? Uh, pretty much, yeah. It's, uh, I mean, the number that that came out was uh, was uh, more than forty five percent from Second Harvest. Uh, very, a very good report, very comprehensive. And uh, to be honest, it's, uh, yeah, we can do better. I mean, there's lots of things we can do. And, and frankly, you know, with with food inflation and higher food prices, a, a nation that values food will not waste food as much. But we're still wasting a lot of food. So are we valuing food more, getting us to, to, to waste less? That's the question. What do you think? Well, I mean, the, the two things are related. I mean, people need food. They're going for free food, and we're wasting a lot of food. You know, the, it, it feels like the answer is in front of us. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's, not, it's not easy. But the answer, you know, this is not an intractable issue. We have components of a solution here. So... Yeah. I mean, get yeah, right the back, only get thing right that to, I, to right the only thing I didn't like about the the report is that they have it, they didn't actually uh, measure progression because it was their second uh, yeah. report. Uh, the last report was in 2019, and it was this one was as dramatic and numbers were as high as the one in 2019. Now, are we getting – because we've been talking about waste way more in the last few years. Mm-hmm. Are we are not being more careful? Certainly at, in, in our home, my kids, our family, uh, we're more careful about waste. Uh, well, you, I, I, your hypothesis, that's one of the things that leads to less consumption by a bigger population of food in general at grocery stores is people are being smarter about what they buy. That's one yeah, I think things, so. I think. Yeah, absolutely. Volume has gone down, and uh, or it's it's gone sideways when, from a sales perspective. I mean, I I I personally don't really mind eating leftovers like three days in a row. I mean, I does if it's if it's to save waste. Yeah. You know, well, no problem. The we, other we, thing that we're noticing in some of our research with uh, with uh, food waste is that if a lot of Canadians think that if you're composting. You're not wasting. Huh. So let me ask you a question, Michael. If you're composting, are you wasting food? Uh, do you see it as waste or do you see it as, you know, being part of, of the well, circle of life? <laughs> well, if I, if I buy a bunch of fruit and I let it go to waste and then throw it in the composter, I'm wasting food. If, you know, whatever else goes in the composter. So I think the answer is I'm wasting food. If I buy food, don't eat it and throw it right in the composter because I bought too much food. Or You know, those ridiculous uh, plastic wrap cucumbers that fall to the bottom of the drawer and then they look like <laughs> they look like a, a they look like a lab those experiment. Darn cucumbers. Those damn cucumbers. In one week, they look like a lab experiment. So a uh, guilty yeah. is charged. Yeah, that was a, actually that was a tomato. You thought it was a cucumber that turned green. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's revolting. Uh, let's uh, let's move, let's move on from that, and I think lots more to be spoken about that. So we'll keep a, a close eye on on that. Let's talk about the great cheese robbery. Have you heard about this over no. in over Another in the UK? Robbery? In the UK, Chef, Chef Jamie Oliver uh, is asking social media to help. 20- oh, I thought I, I, I thought you just said if Jamie Oliver stole. Oh, no, he's twenty two metric tons. 48,488 pounds of award-winning cheddar worth 300,000 British pounds, 390,000 U.S., was stolen in a scam in the U.K. So Jamie Oliver has texted or put on his Instagram, 10.5 million Instagram followers, to be on the look for a lorry loads of posh cheese, 1,000 wheels did, of did cloth it, wrapped Did not catch cheddar. the people involved? It was a scam. It was a, it was a con. So these people were posing – as a distributor for a major French retailer, and uh, they weren't – that wasn't wow. who they were, and they've stolen the cheese. Can you fit that into a car? No, they, they, stole, the, they stole the whole truck. Like this is a 1,000 oh wheels God. of cheese. Like they, they said, yep. So it's a scam, right? It's a whole – Oh, my God. It's a confidence thing. So, uh, you know, I, his, his advice, which, of course, Jamie being Jamie said, if the deal seems too good to be true, it probably is. 
Turn on palm. <laughs> Advice for all those uh, all those buyers out That's there. That's a lot thousand. of cheddar. Jeez. It's been a great episode, uh, and uh, always a treat uh, talking about important things, man. These are uh, these are key issues for for Canadians, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk with you about these things. And once again, thanks to uh, Pear for joining us on the pod, and uh, we got lots more great interviews coming up. Well, great job setting uh, the interview up, uh, my friend, because I well, know you did a lot of work. My my pleasure. Uh, listen, uh, my Michael LeBlanc, a uh, retail keynote speaker, media entrepreneur, and uh, now one of the NRF's top fifty retail voices for twenty twenty five. New, new bit of a Bravo. new designation Bravo. matters to anybody in the you know who knows the NRF in the U.S. But anyway, and you are not the NRC, the no, NRF, not the National <laughs> Rifle Federation, National Retail Federation. That's right. To be clear. That's right. Rolling. Exactly. And you are? Sylvain Chalmois, the food professor. Safe travels, everybody. Take care.